In the early 90s, Professor Itai Wada became frustrated with the prevailing keyboard layouts of the time. As a programmer and Unix professional, he desired a keyboard that would cater to his unique needs. Unable to find such a device, he co-developed a keyboard under PFU Limited of Japan. The device that he created was popular among enthusiasts at the time and has seen mainstream success in the decades that have followed, despite only undergoing small iterative changes since its inception. Well, today we're going to be reviewing the most prolific version of this keyboard, the Happy Hacking Keyboard Professional 2. The Happy Hacking Keyboard Professional 2 is a Topper Switch keyboard designed for developers, programmers, and other power users. But as you'll see, it holds its own in gaming applications as well. And if by the end of this review you decide to pick up this device, please consider using our affiliate links to do so. This example has an all charcoal finish. They do have a white version as well, and it brings stealth to a whole new level by lacking any printed keycaps. Now they do, of course, offer a version with printed keycaps, and this isn't just an aesthetic choice. It has a practical application as well. This is meant to offer a wide compatibility across operating systems and applications, and for that reason, the lack of any printed keycaps allows you to completely customize the board any way you wish and not have to worry about changing out those keycaps. Now, it, the only branding on it is a small logo in the lower right-hand corner, which I don't mind too much, and the minimal bezels around the perimeter give it a compact look. The layout is more or less your standard 60% keyboard layout that you're probably familiar with, but with a few notable differences. Caps lock is replaced with control, a tilde is replaced with escape, backspace is replaced with a tilde, backslash replaced with delete, the alt keys have been moved out one key and replaced with meta keys, and the right shift has been condensed a little bit and they squeeze in a function key just to the right of it. But as I alluded earlier, many of these can be customized to suit your specific needs by utilizing the included dip switches. The most prominent feature about this keyboard are probably the Toper switches, and it's probably worthwhile to explain a little bit more about this switch type because this is one of just a handful of keyboards that actually leverage it, and this may be my only opportunity to talk about it. Pressing the keycap down lowers a plastic slider and flattens a rubber dome. Underneath the dome is a metal spring. While the spring generates smooth and linear resistance, the dome provides a tactile bump that we've come to expect. Unlike mechanical switches that rely on physical contact to complete a circuit and register a keystroke, Toper switches are capacitive and rely on a sensor to detect a keystroke. This means that dust and dirt have much less of an impact on Toper switches because they won't interfere with any physical contact like they would on a mechanical board. These characteristics make Toper switches some of the longest lasting switch types available. Because Toper switches contain elements of both membrane and mechanical boards, they kind of feel like a hybrid of the two. They have a long travel distance, like what you'd find on a mechanical board, four millimeters, and they also have a tactile bump, but the tactile bump is more gradual and smooth like what you'd find on a membrane board. And similar to a membrane board, that tactile bump is found at the top of a keystroke, even though a key press registers in the middle. It's definitely not like anything you've ever experienced if you've never used a Toper switch before. If you enjoy linear mechanical switches like Cherry MX Reds, you'll probably like these quite a bit. It uses a PBT plastic for the keycaps and an ABS plastic for the body and the spacebar. And generally speaking, PBT is preferred to ABS because it's resistant to shine and discoloration. There are two USB-A pass-throughs which are convenient but they are very low power so don't expect to charge any high power devices off of them. Flipping the board over you'll find three different angle adjustments, the default height, a small leg just to give it a little bit of a raise, and longer legs if you want more of an aggressive angle while typing. 
Now let's talk about those dip switches that you find at the back of the keyboard. While most modern keyboards or accessories will leverage some type of software to make acute customizations to whatever you want the keys or macros or clicks to be, this only uses dip switches, which may seem inconvenient at first, but then think about the target audience. You may be using this keyboard on a system that may not support that included software. So you need to actually modify the keyboard itself in order to change up what you want the keys to do. The first option is the HHK mode, which by default has both of the switches off, and this offers the greatest amount of compatibility. The second one is Light EXT, and if your operating system supports it, such as Windows 10, this is the one you'll probably want to use because it has added functionality, and this is done by turning the first switch on and second switch off. And then finally, if you're going to be using this keyboard with a Mac computer, you want to have the first switch off and second switch on. The last four are independent from one another and are for permanent useful key changes. Turning on three will change delete to backspace. Four changes the left meta to function. Five swaps the meta in alt keys. And six enables wake up when you type on the keyboard. If you get confused by any of this, you can just look at the keycaps. The top symbol represents what the key does by default, and the symbol on the front says what it does when you switch the dip switches or you leverage the function keys. And if you went for the blank keycaps like I did, then you better make sure you don't lose the manual. Quality of the keyboard is hit or miss. As I explained before, you can expect this keyboard to last for a very long time just because it leverages a switch type that is least prone to fail. However, that's not to say it's perfect. There are only two small rubberized pads on the bottom, which essentially do nothing, and there are none on the feet either, so the keyboard definitely slides around a lot more than I'm used to. There's also no metal backplate. It's entirely made of plastic and feels pretty light as a result. It's slightly more flexible than you're expecting, but this would only really be a problem if the keyboard were any bigger. The flimsy cover concealing the dip switches isn't captive and can be easily lost. And I understand for maybe cost reasons why they decided to make the body out of ABS plastic, but the spacebar is completely inexcusable. The spacebar is going to be your most commonly used character on your keyboard because literally every word you type has a space after it, and in gaming you're also going to be using the spacebar quite a bit. So the fact they decided to use ABS with this and not PBT is really nonsensical. As a functional device, it performs very well. It definitely has the steepest learning curve I've ever experienced with a new keyboard though. The layout is very comfortable and keeps all keys within reach of the home row. And I especially really enjoy the backspace placement and I think more keyboards should leverage this. The cable coming out of the top of the keyboard should definitely be offset to one side or the other. It makes it easier to route cables around monitors or anything that you have placed in the center of your desk. It's usually much easier to route cables if it's on one side or the other. And there's also lots of unused space on either side of the bottom row. This could have been used for Windows keys or additional function keys, or probably a dedicated arrow directional keys, because what they currently have set up makes no sense at all. While we're on that subject, why not use the WASD keys for your directional arrows? Those Toper switches provided probably the most soothing typing experience I've ever had. And on a side note, you don't notice just how much you look at your keyboard until you completely remove the keycaps. So unless you're an incredibly proficient typist and you're very familiar with the funky layout of this keyboard, I don't recommend going that route. That layout was most noticeable in gaming applications when you don't have time to look down and re-familiarize yourself with the unorthodox layout. You may have noticed that I have yet to reveal the price of this keyboard, and that's for a good reason. Those satisfying and reliable Topra switches come at a very steep asking price. This keyboard with no lighting, no macros, no media keys, no wireless connectivity, comes in at $200 and $50, making it easily the most expensive keyboard ever to cross my desk. And that makes it very hard to recommend. So what are my recommendations then? Well, if you want to experience Toper switches, you don't really have a whole lot of options. You have the HHKB and its variations, which retail for roughly that same asking price. And then there is the gaming subsidiary known as Real Force, which is 
essentially the same toper switches, but they have lighting effects and all of the same features you look for in a gaming keyboard, but those retail for $250 to upwards of $350. The Cooler Master Nova Touch is more of a mainstream keyboard. That's a little bit less expensive, around $200, but they are almost impossible to find. I don't even know if they make it anymore. And then finally, there's the Leopold 660 and 980, which again are expensive and difficult to get your hands on. But if you're not really interested in the Toper switches and you just want to experience a 60% board, then there are a lot more options available to you. The Vortex Poker 3, Annie Pro 2, KB Paradise V60, and Ducky 1 2 Mini will probably all serve you well and come in at roughly half the asking price of this keyboard. Most of my criticisms could be forgiven if it weren't for that astronomical asking price. I understand the plastic feel, toper feedback, and simplified design are all part of the HHKB experience, but that's just not good enough for most people. For a very specific group of power users that share Professor Wada's vision for a perfect typing experience, this keyboard is definitely for you. For everyone else, you'll be much better served with a traditional 60% board with good old fashioned mechanical switches and you'll save quite a lot of money in the process. Thank you for watching this review. If you appreciated it or found it helpful, then go ahead and give it a like. And if you want to see a keyboard review of a one-handed device that's designed specifically for gaming, then go ahead and watch that video review up here and watch our other video reviews to be a more informed consumer and get our take on many popular gaming products out there. And if you want to purchase any of these products on Amazon, you'll find those in our video description. Those are our affiliate links. And we definitely appreciate when you use those. And we are also doing a giveaway right now for a Turtle Beach Elite Atlas headset that likewise can be found in the video description if you want a chance to enter. Well, thanks again for watching, guys, and stay subscribed so you know when our newest content is ready to watch. We'll catch you guys next time.